Okay, guys, let's get started. You need your uh, you need your notebooks today, and I'm going to tell you what what our topic is, so that uh, so that we can get started. You don't need your computers anymore, so I'd appreciate it if you would just close them, save your battery and our focus. Today is April 7th. This is B4. And the topic today is a quick review of the fall of the Qin and then the rise of the Han. So the Han Dynasty is going to be the peak. The Qin is the rise of wave two. The Han is the peak of wave two. So let's first start with the fall of Qin. You've watched the video, the documentary on it. Maybe you remember how it fell, but let's just make sure so that you're clear. You're welcome. Fall of Chen first. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Fall of Chen, April 7. I believe I'm right on these dates, but if I'm off by a year, who cares? Because that's a minor detail. The the overall picture is, is valid. Qin Dynasty started in 221. Qin Emperor only ruled for 10 years and died. So let's say he's, he dies around 211. And that's when that scene that we saw last time of his, his eunuch forging his succession edict um, puts Hu Hai on the throne, our imbecile. Fusu kills himself. Zhao Gao, the eunuch, then goes on to manipulate that emperor, Hu Hai, by putting him in the palace. Hu Hai decides that his palace isn't big enough. He wants a bigger palace. And then he just spends the next years enjoying concubines in the palace. This chinless wonder. Um, <laughs> that actor is so amazing. Um, and Zhao Gao presides over the collapse of the empire. How does the empire collapse? I showed you last time. Do you remember the two characters I showed you and, and what I asked you to observe about the two characters from the film? I showed you a couple of pictures of them. I said, what classes are they? Do you remember this? Okay, so one of them was from which class and the other was from which class? Good, okay. Um, Well, here they are. So let me tell you the story of what is called. Okay, so the empire is go, everybody is getting just absolutely sick of this Hu Hai. I mean, it was hard enough under Chen during his consolidation stage, but we can at least say a lot of what he was doing was necessary. He was trying to consolidate, as you all seem to have, most of you seem to have gotten, right? But when Hu Hai came in, the dynastic cycle writ small, from a great emperor to the next generation, the very worst imaginable. I want a bigger palace. I want more chariots. I want more luxury. So it's the same old thing that we saw with Zhou Xin of the late Shang, with King Yo of the Western Zhou. Now we have Hu Hai, the pattern of the bad last emperor. And he's only the second emperor of a dynasty that's supposed to last for 10,000 generations. Like Hitler saying he wanted the Thousand Year Reich, right? And it lasted for five years. Um, well, 15, whatever. Um, how did things go bad? Well, the taxes on the people are high, and the taxes on the people are now to build his Ufang palace, and you don't have to write that down. But, um, and besides that, of course, the counter-revolutionaries, the aristocrats who had been stripped of their elite status, had their fees taken away from them, of course they're angry. And that's where this guy, who I showed you the picture of, he was riding the horse. You all identified that. It's a no-brainer. So that's where Xiang Yu comes in, of the Chu state. That's the big state on the south of the Yangtze, the biggest uh, 
the biggest of the last six states. So he wants to overthrow Chen in order to restore the kingdom of Chu and possibly claim the mandate of heaven for the entire kingdom or, or, or empire. And he's a noble. A couple of other people also rise up. Here's the first thing that happens with the commoners. The commoners start rebelling too. So notice, this is a turning point in history here. The first commoner to rise up rose up because this happened to him. He was sent and told, you are leading 100 men from your village to the Great Wall to work on the Great Wall. This is a legalist order, right? As he was walking, leading his men, for whom he was responsible to reach the Great Wall on X day by X hour, a severe rainstorm happened, a mudslide wiped out a mountain pass they needed to cross in order to get to the Great Wall on time. And they knew, there's no way we're going to get there. Quickly show yourselves, make sure that all of you understand the dilemma that this detachment of men sent to go to that wall and get there on time. What is the dilemma that they face? Talk to each other. What would you do if you were them? You know you're not going to make it on time. What are you going to do? And so what are you going to do? There are no Mongols. Stop talking about Mongols. What's the name? He's, what, somebody over here is talking Mongols. What, what word should he be using? Xiongnu. Xiongnu. I still can't say that U sound in Chinese. I hate it with a purple passion. Um, okay, so what are you going to do? Clearly pat yourself on the back. You said, well, if you show up late, you're going to be punished, possibly killed. Can you go back to your village? No, because you're going to be punished, possibly killed. So what are you going to do? Their solution was, well, you know what? There's a hundred of us, and we're all fairly sturdy men, so let's just disappear into the mountains and become bandits slash rebels. And that's what they do. We're dead anyway, so we may as well go down fighting. And that idea, that, that starts happening all over the place, more and more, all across the Chen Empire. Does Hu Hai know? No, Hu Hai is buried under concubines. Does Zhao Gao know? Yeah, but I don't quite a, he seemed to be in a massive state of denial. Um, this is where Liu Bang comes in. Like the last guy we talked about, Liu Bang was a commoner of a small, unimportant town, and he was made sheriff of this town. Sheriff is a very, very low job, right? He's just a little minor official, and he is detached, sent to, to send a detachment of 100 men, not to go to the Great Wall, but to, to work on Chen's mausoleum. And a similar thing happens. It's not a rainstorm this time. It doesn't matter. These are small details. But what's, what happens is they have to camp as they're walking 150 miles or whatever. They have to camp overnight, and they wake up, and like five guys have defected. The next night, five more have defected. I was given 100 men. I'm going to show up with 70. Well, this is not good. And so they, have, they come to the same decision. Okay? So he runs up into the hills as well. Because the, the punishments of legalism leave him no choice. Yeah, so here is our friend, Liu Bang. I think I told you about his character. His character was this. He was a commoner. He did indulge himself in alcohol all day. This is a misleading subtitle because it's not Liu Bang talking. It's some old man who comes to him and says, Robert, all I do is drink. And he says, why, do, why did you come to me just to tell me all you do is drink? He says, all I do is drink because I'm a sage and nobody will listen to me and help me lead them to become the next, the next emperor. Um, but, uh, but he does happen to indulge in alcohol all day quite a bit too. I, as I told you last time, he's a zoo guy. He's in school, no. Family, no. Farming, no. 
Wine? Absolutely. He loves to drink. And so do his friends. And so they just get plastered a lot. And um, But people like him very much. Why? Because he's very loyal to his friends, and he's just very, very charismatic. He's lighthearted. He's playful. He's funny. He's high energy. And he will, if, you, if he likes you, he will, he will do everything in the world for you. And people know that, and he demonstrates it over and over and over again. Loyal friendship. And, and he's just charismatic. People like him. He's fun. He's funny. He's not real smart. He can barely read. But people start coming to his rebel group and the, his bandit group in the mountains because they hear about this guy, and they just hear how like all of these great people come to him because they think there's something about him. And so they come down from the mountain, and they start going to certain towns saying, we want to liberate you from the Chen. Join our revolution. And the towns, there's a really funny scene in this movie where they're like, they go back to their hometown that they were sent from. They show up. Okay, we think we're strong enough to go back now. We think Chen is weak enough. We don't think they can kill us. We think we can get the, the townspeople to actually kill the Chen officials of our town. And here's the funny part. They plan to do it by going through the town and with bows and arrows, the chin's not going to let them in. The official's not going to let them in. They're not going to open this, the city wall gates. So we're going to, with bows and arrows, write letters on cloth, tie it to the arrows, and to shoot our arrows over the wall so that the people can read it and say, oh, it's Liu Bang. It's Liu Bang, and, 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 you know, they're back. They're back. They didn't die. Oh, how great. Open the doors. Let them in, right? That's what they want to do. <laughs> but the scene gets funny because this guy's not educated. He's like, oh, God, I don't know enough words. I don't know, I don't know how to write these words. I don't know these characters. Who, somebody who knows enough characters, come here and write something. He's, and even if you can't write, just like draw a picture of yourself or something. It's hilarious. They're just a bunch of illiterates. They are absolute rednecks, right? And they, and they shoot the things over. But sure enough, the, the townspeople read it and they're like, oh, it's Liu Bang, man. He was so cool. He bought me a, you know, a jug of wine that day. I remember him. Open up the gates, right? And they kill the chin and they overthrow him. They love this guy, right? So he's just an absolutely popular dumb jock, basically. Um, but he's a nice guy, unlike most dumb jocks. No. But the point is he's illiterate. That's the funny thing. We're semi-literate. Now, question. Hmm? The Chu Han contention forms. That aristocrat, Xiang Yu, he starts taking on the Qin army and he wins. He defeats like a million-man Qin army. He has a small Chu army and he defeats it and takes its soldiers. They join him. And so he seems to be the surefire founder of the next dynasty, the noble. But Liu Bang is in the way, and it seems there's no way that Liu Bang can actually like, beat this guy who now has Chen's army under him from the state of, Xu, of Chu. Now I'm going to pause. This is interesting. I've got to rush through it because this is the history of China uh, in the second semester. It's horrible. So I'm only going to pause and ask you to think about this as a most interesting thing. This alternative history, alternate history, turning points, forks. We're at a fork in China's history right now. If Xiang Yu the noble wins this civil war, trying to overthrow the Qin, what type of new order dynasty is he going to set up politically, socially, and so forth? What will China become if a noble wins? That's that fork of the road. Now, what if a commoner wins, a semi-literate commoner wins, a drunk who can barely read, who has suffered under the Qin, the threat of death. What direction will China take if he speak quickly um, uh, amongst yourselves? And oh, but first, before you do, critical thinking time again. Did we do factors of analysis? Huh? Yes, factors of analysis. So what are they? I am trying to help you learn how to think quickly and efficiently so that you can do well on all social studies things. Whenever you're like looking at a human society, whenever you're looking at history, what are your lenses? What are your factors of analysis? They're simple. No, 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 no. That's critical thinking. That's not factors of analysis. That's simple critical thinking. That's like, that, at first glance, on second thought, that's just thinking for the first time, 
really, right? Well, this is my reaction, but I never thought about it. Let me actually look at it and think about it. But now I'm asking a second, uh, a different question altogether, factors of analysis. Did we talk about it last time? Oh, okay, well, let's, okay. Those of you who said yes, remind me to kill you later. Uh, here they are. We're looking at a massive group of people called the Chinese. And we're trying to be able to analyze this very, very complex and fuzzy and you know, hard to focus on thing clearly. Analysis is called breaking a complex thing down into its parts. That's what analysis is, literally. It's breaking complex into its major parts. And so tell me what I'm leaving out here. Maybe I am leaving out a major factor of analysis. How do we analyze, analyze a human civilization, millions of people. How do we analyze it? How do we see it clearly? Well, we talk about its politics. How is it governed? Here we are at a fork in the road. We have Xiang Yu, we have Liu Bang. They have to make, both of them are going to be asking these questions. How are we going to govern? What answers will they give? Your second factor of analysis, social. How are we going to organize society? What are, going to hire, what, you know, what are the power relations going to be? What sort of classes will we have? Will there be a hierarchy or will there not? All of that, social relations, right? So social organization, factors of analysis. You look at the United States, you look at Europe, you look at Mars, if there's people there, or Martians, um, the factors of analysis will always apply anywhere. This is just simple, clear thinking. Economic, how are we gonna distribute the resources? What are we gonna make? And how are we gonna distribute them, right? Military, and then culture. And culture is just the software, going back to Martin Jacques. Right? Culture is the way your brains are wired by your culture. What do you believe? What sort of actions do you do? Do you kowtow or do you shake hands or do you do this, right? All that, so customs, values, beliefs, filial piety, individualism, that's culture. Writing system, practices, all that, that's culture. Now. Back to our turning point, the Chu Han contention. Did I give you that term? Shang Yu is from Chu. Liu Bang is from a little unimportant town. He's given a little important town named Han. So this is called the, this turning point. Chen is falling, Chen is crumbling everywhere. The contention, this means conflict between Chu and Han. Chu is Shang Yu, the noble. Han is Liu Bang, the commoner. So this is the five-year civil war to decide the future of China. Talk about the factors of analysis and predict what alternate universes China would have gone into if Xiang Yu had won versus what Yeo Bang did. And include in the culture, please hear me, this is my last piece of advice, ideology, Confucianism, Taoism, legalism. Which one would Xiang Yu choose? Which one would Liu Bang choose? Now I'm done. Go discuss. Go through your factors of analysis.
How do you always end up staying there when I always shuffle you guys? Do you just not move when I tell you to move to your table? No, you you sit up to and then the two and then the top of the Ah, okay. Did that help? You're welcome. So what ism would he have chosen? What would he have done economically? Picture the consolidation phases of both of them. They've got to make decisions economically, politically, socially, ideologically, which means philosophically. I want you to stand up and report what your table concluded. If you don't, if you have like a, one of us thought this and one of us thought that, go ahead and, and do that. So we think that politically, Shang, you would have done this. Go down, each one on and on, and describe the two paths they could take. Jacqueline, I want you to do that for your table. Just, just summarize yours. Um, woman, I want to hear you talk. So I want you to summarize yours. Woman, I want to hear you talk. Yep. Momo, I want to hear you talk. Today is this International Women's Day, I've just decided. Aaron, I want you to report for yours. Sue Ben, I want you to report for yours. Okay, let's 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 move on. L let's move on. I want everybody who I just designated as the table speaker to stand up. It's International Women's Day, and up goes Noah. <laughs> Momo, that's you. This is the last man standing way to get information quickly and efficiently from all people in the room. If those of you standing, if you hear all of the ideas from all of these factors of analysis, left and right, the, the fork in the road, if you hear that, like, okay, it's already been covered by the time it gets to me, Sit down when everything that, that your table said has been said. Keep standing if you've got more to add. Noah Sardis. No, I'm sorry, no. It's International Women's Day. Men last. Allison. Why would he believe in Taoism? Good, why? I'm not saying right, I'm just saying good, why? Okay, okay, okay. And Sean, you what we have done ideologically? Which one of these? Confucianism, why? Okay. Do we have any alternate predictions from the other groups on which ideology they would have gone with? What do you got, Momo? So under legalism, everybody is equal, and as a commoner, he would want equality. Okay. Now, I see Nadine wants to respond to this. Well, so nice. We've got a nice little controversy here. Yep. When you mentioned that you talked about how he had his life threatened by the law, like that which is kind of a legalist way to like the harsh punishments, that he would have had to endure them as a commoner, so I don't think he would want to touch them. What do you think? What do you think? It's okay. It's perfectly okay to be persuaded or else to go, yeah, but, one or the other. Okay, so good. So thanks. So thanks, Nadine, for, for helping us see more clearly. He suffered under legalism and had to run to the hills because of it. Um, real estate agents are calling me. Stop. Stop. Okay. Um, do we have any other, any other predictions on the ideological front? Taoism, Confucianism, legalism. Okay. Politically. And all of you follow here. Did you discuss this? First of all, what options does China have in its 
what precedents have been set in terms of administration of the, the land and the people? What are the choices that they have? Close but not precise. Bureaucracy and aristocracy is not a political administrative thing. Feudalism, right? Which depends on aristocracy, which is a social category, right? Okay, so what do you think? Did anybody come up with any third possibilities besides either go back to feudalism or stick with centralized bureaucracy? Any tables come up with a third possibility? Well, I mean, as far as the above is concerned, like we weren't sure whether you pick one of them or you just kind of try to play it by ear and just see what is people thinking, maybe and just kind of communicate with them. Yeah. Okay. Like, really know if you, because like if he's not really, I guess, educated, he wouldn't really. It's like he's seen both of these things kind of work and not work, so he might not be sure what to do, and he might consult other sages. Or okay. What? Well, which one would you choose if you were him? And you knew China's history. Now think about that. This is this is interesting. Most interesting thing stuff. This is interesting. Which one would you choose? If you say centralized bureaucracy, how long was its track record? <laughs> Fifteen max by the time the the dynasty fell. Um, if you say feudalism, how long was its track record? Hint, the Zhou Dynasty started in 1050 BCE. King Yo cried wolf in 771. So the Western Zhou, how long did it survive under feudalism? 1050 to 770. Roughly 300 years. 1050 to 770. Okay, that's... <laughs> we didn't see that. Um, okay, so mm -hmm. what were your thoughts then? What do you think? What do you think each of them would do in terms of administration? maybe because like he's not so educated and literate so he might just think of experience from the past and he thinks that feudalism well feudalism lasted longer because bureaucracy just started so he might go back to feudalism because he would think it's much more successful than bureaucracy okay does anybody have any tensions challenges or qualifications on that one do any of the re okay and so what would Chang Yu have done Chang Yu um bureaucracy no, um, feudalism as well, because he, it, like, there's, like, more hierarchy there, and he's a noble, so he knows he'd be up there, and he'd get more advantages. He'd get his land back. Yeah. Subban, what do you got? I have a question. Yeah. Do you know how, um, under the Chirong dynasty, burned a lot of books and secured a lot of scholars? So I was wondering, like, to what extent would Li Bang would actually know about the Zhou dynasty's history and how the feudalism well, the burning of those books um, wouldn't have erased people's memories of everything, right? Yeah, but still there should be like a the, the, No, because he was alive during, he was an adult, he grew up under Chen, um, and it's not as if people didn't stop telling stories and, you know, storytelling of, of the the past didn't stop just because the books were burned. Um, and also customs, right? And, and just all sorts of stuff. Because it was only for 50 years. Yeah, it was. You know, this would be something that happened in 2001, right? Your dad, your grandparents, everybody who's lived longer than you, even if. It, but, but Yo Bong was not a teenager when this happened. Um, so the memory of it has certainly not vanished, even though the books were collected and burned. Anything else? You know, we could burn the, all every Bible in the world right now, but people would not forget the Bible in 10 years if we did that, right? Okay, so uh, did your table have anything else on, on what direction China would have taken, depending on who won the Chuhan contention politically? Do you think that Liu Bang would have taken, again, centralized bureaucracy? You think he would have gone to feudalism because it lasted longer. Nobody's challenging that? I would. The other one. Yeah. Get your words down. Get the full term down. Good. Yeah, good, Aaron. I mean, do you see your point? 
if we go if, if I do feudalism, then I'm making people just be like low uh, low end of the totem pole commoners, serfs basically for aristocrats, working for aristocrats. Um, so okay. Economically, well, actually, does anybody have anything interesting to say about the economic, the military, the cultural? Because otherwise, I just want to move on. John. Okay. Um, in terms of social factors, I think if the Shang youth took over the Qing dynasty, then the social confidence would probably be the same again. Because the Qing dynasty is trying to play the game to the next game. Yeah. And so you can have a seat. And so why is this interesting? Because if, if Shang Yu wins, we seem to all agree. Why is this interesting? If Shang Yu wins, China goes back to the feudal system. What do you predict, predict would happen if China went back to vassals owning fiefs? And so what would happen to China for the next, you know? And then break into pieces of, uh, we, huh? Uh, we, we've seen feudalism break down once. We would let, let's ignore the Achilles heel and, may, and repeat our mistake and just make it all over again, right? It doesn't work in the long term. And so we would have had a second three to 400 year World War II, right? Uh, so a lot is at stake here. And it just so happens that, of course, the Obang wins and, um, and Shang Yu loses. How? Shang Yu is a noble and he's arrogant. He thinks he's superior to everybody. And so when people come to him and say, let me help you overthrow this hated Hu Hai Chen Dynasty. Let me help you. I am a, a military strategist. I want to help you. I can tell you great plans. I'm a genius. I'm bright. I've studied this stuff. Let me help. He'd be like, you're a commoner. Go be my sword carrier. He refused to listen to anybody who was not elite like him. He was arrogant. Liu Bei, I'm sorry, Liu Bang. He knew his weaknesses and was like, God, thank you. So, let me buy you a, a, a jug of wine for coming and offering me your military advice. Have a drink with me. I want to hear it. And he would listen to people and he would apply their advice. And so the word spread. And people just loved him. And so he won, long story short, in the Chuhan contention. One thing that happened before he won, there was a very interesting thing, and it's very complicated, and I'm, I'm only going to tell you this. A, a, king of, uh, a king of Chu, because Xiang Yu was not the king of Chu, he was a noble of Chu, he put a king of Chu in power just so he could sort of like have legitimacy, and that king of Chu said this, whoever captures Chen's capital of Xiang Yu first can become the next emperor, the king said. And Liu Bei, I'm sorry, Liu Bang, the commoner, captured Xiang Yu first, uh, captured the, the Chen capital first. And when Xiang Yu found out about that, and all the people loved him because he was really nice. He didn't let his soldiers rape anybody. He didn't let them loot. He didn't let them steal. He didn't let them, you know, take property or anything. He was, and so the people loved him. And they were like, and then Xiang Yu heard about it, and he was like, that bastard, that, that commoner, he got the capital. No, and so he ran with his massive army, chased Liu Bang out, and when he got there, he burned the capital down to the ground. The only reason that this, and then he ended up losing anyway. The only reason this matters is this. What happened to China's books under the first emperor? What did he do to all of China's classic texts? He burnt them. 
He had people search every single house and burn every single copy of the Xu Jing and the Xu Jing and all the Confucian classics and all, and, the, and all the Taoist classics and on and on and on. Anything that's not legalist. Except he kept, you'll remember that one detail, he kept a copy of all of them in his imperial library in the capital. And Shang Yu burned the imperial capital down. And so we lost all copies, all copies of China's three ancient dynasties literature. Because Chen tried to save copies. He wasn't trying to erase history. He was trying to consolidate his reign. Shang Yu, this noble, comes in and in a fit of rage burns the capital down erasing Chinese history. And then Liu, Bei, uh, Liu Bang went. Now, I want you to draw a, um, uh, a chart that looks like so. Can you turn on the light, please? Oops. Political ideological. You might want to write somewhere in your margins, just somewhere like an asterisk or something, a little star, because here's the big note. Here's the so what of this. The table is not the so what of it. The so what of the table is, by the time we finish this lesson, all of China in its main foundations will be set forever. By the time we finish this peak of wave two today, all of these things will be set, and China will not change in its basic shape for the Sui, Tong, Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing dynasties. They will have their character set. Think of a cement foundation of a, of a skyscraper. We have just hardened that foundation by the time it's ended. Notice, everything's still up in the air. What do we got to do? So we're going to go from Liu Bei's, I'm sorry, Liu Bang's, from Chen, what Chen had, to what Liu Bang did in each one of these things, in his consolidation. You will see that it's hilarious. And then what his fourth generation emperor, the fourth emperor of the Han Dynasty, he's the great one. He's the one who left that wordless steely. I showed you that, right? He's the one who left that. He is the greatest emperor of China. He shaped China. He happened to reign for 60 years. That was long enough for him. If John F. Kennedy reigned 60 years, do you know who would be president of the United States right now? John F. Kennedy. He was elected in 1960. He would be president until 2020 if he, was, if he ruled 60 years. Wu Di ruled 60 years. That was long enough for him to actually shape everything and consolidate it so that when he died, it was solid. Okay? So this is, this is it. This is the peak of wave two sets China in stone. So Chen, politically, what was Chen's political system? Here we go. What was Chen's political system? How did they govern? That's not a political system. What was their political system? How did they govern? Centralized bureaucracy, right? Hell and damnation. Okay. Oh, okay. Good try. What was Chen's ideology? Legalism. What was Chen's economy? How did Chen... Chen's economy... Did he need to tax the people heavily? Think about it. 
think about everything that Chen had to do in his consolidation. Did he need to tax the people heavily? Yes. Yes, yes because he had to fund what things? The Great Wall, the Mausoleum, the Imperial Highway System, a new bureaucracy, all sorts of stuff. So there were high taxes. The taxes were high under Chen, not because he necessarily wanted them to be, but he needed them to be for the short term. Uh, the laws, uh, the ideology was legalism. LEG is for legal, I should just put laws. I'm sorry, I don't have a pen that works well. So the laws, very complex law code. You remember our guy buried with the, the scroll of laws, bamboo scrolls. Very complex because we have to we have to define what is and is not okay. So we can rule like a shadowy presence. And then finally, military. When Chin fell, Liu Bong had to make some decisions. So let's watch what decisions he made. And you see, and you start feeling under LB. That's Liu Bong. Well, here's the first decision he made. This is a political one. If you want to draw the rooster. If you want to draw the rooster, it will help you. Because what did Liu Bang do? Did he decide on bureaucracy or on feudalism? 50-50. He sat on the fence. Here's the Yellow River. Here's the capital city. The white is a centralized bureaucracy, and the dark is feudal. He gave the east away from his capital, to those who helped him win against Xiang Yu, and he gave them feasts. Relatives or generals, drunks who helped him, right? His, his, his drinking buddies who helped him overcome this. He gave them feasts. But he kept on his side commanderies with officials answerable to him. Pause and reflect so you can see how interesting this is. Was this a stupid thing to do? Do you think a smart guy advised him to do this? Pause and reflect very quickly. Discuss amongst yourselves. I claim it's smart. Does anybody want to try to think about it for a second and see why it might be a smart thing to do when you've just done what he did? Has anybody asked this question? What would the situation be if he made this side feudal and that side centralized? Has anybody asked that question? Like, why did he choose to do it that way instead of flip it? Why does that happen to you? That's what I'm asking you. <laughs> okay, you're welcome. I just heard an oh, yeah, what happened? Okay, pat yourself on the back if you said, okay, no, you tell me, what were your thoughts? Why did he do the split? Why did he create fiefs? What, why would a smart person have said, you know what, you should, you should definitely like give some people some land? Loyalty? So what? Who would you anger if you didn't give them land? Who do you think he gave land to, by the way? Now, I see Yan up there, so possibly he did give Yan back to the, the Yan nobles. 
But he didn't give it back to most of the nobles. Notice Chu is no longer here because Chu was all of this area, and Chu was who he fought. Xiang Yi was from Chu. So he didn't restore a lot of the aristocracy because these aren't the Zhao was, but all these other ones are new. New, 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 new. These aren't the old noble families. So who has he just enfiefed? Who has he just given thieves to if they're not the old aristocracy? People he was close to, like People who helped him during, people who helped him during, people who might be pretty powerful, or people who, you know what, I mean, he was a good guy. I swear to you, if you help me, I will, you will, I will so repay you. Well, seems like he did. Why was giving them fiefs away from his capital and surrounding himself by commanderies a smart thing to do? Yeah, because you are the you are the boss of all of these surrounding areas. So your buffer zone, it's all commanderies. So politically, that's what Liu Bang did. Notice, has China gotten a complete firm identity politically yet? No, it's sitting on the fence. So the Han Dynasty, as as this far with Liu Bang, with Liu Bang, has not done it. Ideologically, what do you think? What do you think he did? Do you think he went Confucian? Do you think he went Taoist? Do you think he went legalist? He went Taoist, as you said, except more Zhuang than Taoist, because the guy just the guy just he wasn't a philosopher. He certainly didn't like Confucianism, and there's a very funny story to illustrate it that's in this book. I showed you this book, right? So there's a very funny story in the so much in history of everything before Chen, in which, uh, including the founding of the Han, in which uh, a Confucian came up to Liu Bang, just like Confucius came up to people saying, oh, you've got the opportunity to, cre to create the, the perfect world. Uh, do my policies. And he said it in all this ritually proper speech, like it sounded like a big bookworm, looked like a complete weirdo because he's dressing from fashions 1,200 years old now. And uh, Liu Bang knocked his hat, his Confucian hat, off of his head, and Emperor Liu Bang peed on his hat publicly with his buddies. Yes, yes, this is in Summa Chen. He urinated in this guy's hat to get a laugh with his friends, his, the generals who helped him. And you, I picture him with wine, because they like to drink, and, uh, <laughs> and party. And they all got a big kick out of it, and slapped him on the back and said, that was a good one, do it again, you know. Now, you know, now, like, defecate on it, whatever, right, because they were that vulgar. He pissed on a Confucian's hat. That's what he thought of Confucianism. And this man founded China's Roman Empire, what is considered the golden age of all of China's history. Every empire after, the Tang, the Song, the Ming, the Qing, modeled themselves after the Han, founded by this guy, right? who pissed on a Confucian's hat. Economically, those of you who said, look, he was a, he was a commoner, he was working class, yes, he's going to believe in small government. Small government, you keep our taxes low. Leave the people alone. He was always big-hearted. He was always about leaving people alone, right? He just thought everybody should be friendly. He was a very sentimental guy, very big-hearted. And so the taxes were very low. Let China heal. Government stay off their back, let them farm. As for those laws that were so complicated, Yeo Bang said, and the people loved it, you know those laws that, that you couldn't keep straight in your head because like me, your emperor, you can't read? I'm gonna, and so you get arrested for breaking laws that you didn't even know because you can't read? Here's the new order, free laws. Don't kill each other, don't steal from each other, and don't hurt each other. End. I swear to God, this is Liu Bang's law code when he establishes the Han Dynasty, three laws. What about the Xiongnu? They're still up there. Jin didn't build that great wall just for fun. So militarily, 
Is this Taoist or what? Liu Bang's very cool. Is this Taoist or what? The Xiongnu Confederation is still up there. We saw that, it, I, I argue, that if it, the human geography brought down the chin, because if it weren't for those nomads, there, at that specific time, it wouldn't have been necessary for him to build the Great Wall, and his taxes would not have had to be so high, and the labor wouldn't have been so odious, and the people would not have hated legalism. It is a complete random coincidence of history that the Xiongnu Confederation happened to confederate and become a massive threat at just the time that Chin was trying to do what Chin was trying to do. And he had to raise the taxes on people. And it was the wall that broke the camel's back. Uh, well, so now here's Liu Bang. They're still up there. Guess what he did? I have two choices. Or he was probably told, you have two choices. You can either tax the people to create an army and gather men to go and fight these guys because this is what they're doing now. Well, no, I'll show you in a minute. They're still invading. And that means you've got to raise taxes and they're going to hate you. Or you can bribe the Xiongnu, give them a lot of money, give them a lot of pretty girls, give them a lot of silk, give them a lot of horses, give them a lot of grain. Just pay the Xiongnu leader to leave us alone. It's cheaper than raising an army. A bribe would be maybe a quarter of the cost of sending an army, and you're not killing anybody. So let's just buy peace. Let's just bribe our way into peace diplomatically. The aristocracy hated this. The former nobles hated this. That's not noble to just like say, here, will you not invade us? Here's a lot of money and a lot of nice stuff. Will you just please be nice to us? They despised him. They thought this was so weak. But it worked for a good 40 years, for the most part. This, this Shonu barbarian enjoyed the women, silk, horses, grain, food, wine, and everything else. And China had peace. So that's the military. Okay, those of you interested in inner court stuff, his wife, when he died, he died fairly young. And his wife was the power behind the throne, Empress Lu, L-U. Wikipedia her for some sick, sick, sick inner court stories. I'm looking forward to the last 20 episodes of the Han Dynasty drama I'm watching right now because it's going to go into Empress Lu, yeah. Um, and, and No, that's Empress Wu. But anyway, um, so... Uh, so that's the military, right? Yo Bong was a, basically just, just bribed them, a pacifist, if he could be. Yo Bong dies. The fourth Han emperor. Now we're there. This is the guy who finishes China. And this is, in a sense, the climax of Chinese history, in a sense, because everything is finally settled. Good, we've got time. Come on, don't do this to me. Look at the maps. Here's Chen, and there's Han. Practice the art of noticing, and ask yourself why Han would say, hey, I've got a good idea. Let's conquer. Remember your map quiz. What terrain feature is over here in the northwest? I taught you this because of this moment. What did I hear over here? Which desert? Think twice. The Gobi is up here. The one in the northwest, the Gobi is north. It's in Mongolia, basically. It's the one that has the west soil that goes into the Yellow River. It's up at the top of the paperclip. The Taksimakan is the one in the northeast. I'm sorry, the northwest, going towards Central Asia. Riddle me this. Why would the Han Dynasty say, hey, I've got a great idea. Let's go conquer us some desert. Riddle me that. Why would they do that? And who cares? This is another historically 
huge moment that cements China, and it happens under Wu Di. Liu Bang dies, Wu Di, we are now on to Wu Di. So here we are now on this half of our thing, from Liu Bang to Wu Di, because he's the one who decides everything that his founding ancestor didn't. Liu Bang couldn't decide, or Liu Bang made some decisions. Wu Di came along and made the final decision. Wu Di reigned from 141 to 89. How many years is that? Oh, we already did that. 60 years, right? Oh, I did forget to tell you a fun story. I'm sorry. That Confucian scholar who's, uh, to whose hat uh, Liu Bang peed, he came back because Liu Bang had a party one night with his buddies in his new palace that he just had freshly painted. Robert, picture it. Picture the Forbidden City. It's not. That's Ming Dynasty or Mongols. No, it's Ming Dynasty. But picture a palace like the Forbidden City, freshly painted for the new emperor, the first emperor of the Han Dynasty, and picture his buddies having a drinking party with them and him passing out. And the next morning waking up, to see that the columns in the palace his buddies had taken sword practice to. They're just hacking up the columns drunkenly with their swords because they really were that rowdy. You can't exaggerate how rowdy they were. And he saw that and he was like, Shh. the Confucian came back and a famous quote said, do you see yet that it's easier to conquer on horseback, famous quote, easier to conquer on horseback than it is to rule. Your rowdy ways and your like free and loose style helps you conquer. You're you're sort of aggressive, blah blah blah. It all helps you conquer. But ruling is a completely different thing. I can show you how to keep these guys from tearing up your palace every time they you know, from acting like complete drunks in a bar when they're in the presence of the Emperor and the Son of Heaven. And it's called ritual. And Leo Bay said, don't make it too complicated because I'm not real smart. He really said that. Don't make this ritual too complicated because I'm not real smart. But I'll try it. Because I don't want them being a disgrace, a disgraceful drunks in my palace, right? And so he said, have them bow. Have them treat you like the emperor when in your presence. And they did. So what did we just see happen here? For the first time, has Confucius ever been taken seriously by anybody full stop? Period. No. Chen burned his books. Look what's happening to Confucius. Most interesting thing, Confucius died thinking he was a failure. You saw it in the movie. Nobody will listen to me. People laugh at me. Chen burned his books and buried his scholars, killed his scholars. The founder of the Han peas in his hat. This is, well, no, Confucian, right? We are now 400 years after the death of Confucius. Um, but the heavy yang of the, of the of the drunks in the palace leads to the end of the you know some ritual softness here can really do something to to enhance your uh, sort of the reputation that you send in your palace and and he liked it and so he was like Confucianism has a foothold in China Confucianism has a foothold in the elites for the first time because notice we take China the Confucian country. So far, it hasn't been. So far, Confucius has been completely frowned upon. Now we're ready to talk about the Xiongnu. Is geography destiny? Human geography is, because the Xiongnu were there. We already saw, keep going, don't, don't peter out, Chris. We already saw that the Xiongnu brought down the chin. I mean, they were part of it. Well, they're still there. This is the son, grandson, great-grandson, now Wu Di. It's 50 years after the Obang. And they're back, and they start attacking again. Here's the capital. Notice they came down too close to the capital in an attack. And so Wu Di says, they're not accepting bribes anymore. we got to raise an army. And he raises an army to chase after them. A third of a million men he assembles 
arms, supplies, and sends to go look for them. The green arrows, green arrows are, the, are the Chinese looking for the Xiongnu. The red arrows are the Xiongnu invading the Chinese. And look how, look how unpredictable these nomads are, because they're up there on the step. It's flat. They're just like appearing left and right. You're sending an army with chariots, supply trains, and all sorts of stuff against nomads on horseback. What's going to be the result of that? What's going to be the result of that? Are you going to catch them? They're way too fast. You're way too slow. So what does he do instead? Well, if I can't catch them, I can at least do this, because if they keep on coming around this way, I can extend the Great Wall further west to try to block them and keep them from being able to come around this way. And then I can garrison it. Write the word garrison down. It's a verb, believe it or not, and a noun. Garrisons the Takamakan. Puts army bases there. Permanent soldiers, permanent armies across the northern edge of the Takamakan. How are you going to pay for this army? Who are you going to raise the taxes on? Think of your social hierarchy. Are you going to, you going to raise the taxes on the majority of people, which is peasants? Are you going to raise the taxes on the artisans? Or are you going to raise the taxes on the merchants? Merchants, because they have the most money and the lowest status. How am I going to pay for this army? I'm going to tax the merchants. This led the merchants to go, well, if there's no money in buying and selling merchandise, what do we do to make money? Because we're all about making profit. And these just like taxed commerce out of profitability. What are you going to do with your money? Buy land. Please write that down because from this point, China will be, because he ruled for 60 years, China will be an agrarian civilization. It will always be one in which people invest in land, not in business. Did he intend this? No, he was just trying to get these damn nomads out of his life, right? And it instead cemented the economy of China into an agrarian one. The obey, low taxes, would be high taxes on the merchants, and economically, that cements China as an agrarian civilization, economically. Not commercial, but agrarian. Forevermore, because he happened to enforce that policy for 60 years. Right? Long enough for it to be baked in. Nothing but a most interesting thing for, uh, for your homework, and enjoy your lunch. No, uh, we'll finish. We'll finish uh, with Woody and, and next class. Were the laws still the same? No, the that's a good question. Uh, yeah, because they were too simple. And, and yeah. yeah, so yeah, so he's gonna everything that you saw, everything the Obama did, you're gonna see him revisit. Yeah. And when you look at the, I mean, when you look at the long pattern from like everything from like really like. Look at, look at how it, it finally ended up. Like, stand back and look at it and see. Just see the pattern. But you'll, you'll be able to appreciate that next time. Uh, one of my awards is last Okay, can you send me a. Okay, I'm sorry to have you do this. Hold on one second. Let me finish this.